see that. That light is bright. My lord. How's it going, Epi? Light getting brighter? What the hell? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, uh. Right, let me pull this microphone over. See if it does a little better. Thank you. I don't know what it is, but it grows like crazy. Uh, I got a, I got a corner of them. They're all piled on top of the, uh, the refrigerator that holds the Dr. Pepper machine. Uh, Dr. Pepper there. <laughs> Jason has joined us apparently. <laughs> all right, there you go. Alright. Key instruction to trade number 56. Let's run 56. I can't believe it. Yes, 56. Seems like we've been in the 50s for weeks. Of course, we have been in the 50s for weeks. And I did not turn off my phone. Alright, there we go. Hello, everybody. Effie and Commander. Far Wander. Jason has joined us. DM Channel. Great X Texas Retro Gamer. How's everybody doing today? Uh, we, are, we are gathering in this bright light for another <laughs> round of GM tricks. And afterwards, I've got fake tricks. So uh, i got that to look forward to. Always beef on my table. Uh, occasionally chicken. Occasionally chicken. Once in the blue moon. I don't know really fish. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was, um, I see California was ranking at 110. I don't think we've gotten too bad here. Only about 96, 97, something. But now down in your neck of the woods, I'm guessing you're over 100 already. I saw the other day... Uh, <laughs> I really don't care for our press so much, but... Uh, it said, and I only saw this once, and then it vanished, but it said a, a, a heat dome is going to cover the United States in July and August. And we will be seeing, uh, we will be seeing temperatures from 90 to 120 degrees. And I thought to myself when I read that, isn't that just summer? I mean, Arkansas's always got 100 degree weather. There you go, 105 down Texas. Uh, it's always 100 degrees in August. We've actually had a pretty, uh, pretty easy June because uh, it rained so much. Uh, it broke the temperature up a little bit. That July is cooking up somewhat, but. Uh, uh, just the weather. It's just hot. <laughs> it's just hot. And I think, and I don't think I know this, did it, it feel worse than it is because we're in air conditioning all day. I know yesterday I went outside to sit and read and it was 90 something degrees, 94, 95. And I read for a while and then I had a bunch of boxes to break down. So I broke those down and I thought I was going to pass out. So I'm just not used to the heat anymore. Yeah, it's just summer, man. <sighs> Yeah, the June I thought was pretty easy as Arkansas goes. I mean, it gets, it gets pretty toasty in Arkansas. The humidity through the roof. I remember when I was stationed in Hawaii, they would talk about the humidity in Hawaii being bad in like seventy or something. Very chat well. And here, if it's <laughs> under ninety in the summer, you consider it a good day. It's just the weather. It gets hot in summer. That's all it does. It's cold in the winter. Hot in summer. Except in Arkansas, sometimes it gets hot in the winter, too, so <laughs> it's just the way it is. Yeah, Tim, where you are, the air does get still. And when it's not moving, it's a little tougher to take, especially when you're standing just in the, the wet moisture that's around you. I don't know who posted the other day, but they had in California, it's at 110 degrees and 1% humidity. <laughs> that just cracking me up. There's absolutely no moisture in the air. It's got to be out in Arizona or something. I don't know. I remember one years ago when I first time I went to Roswell, New Mexico, to poke around the alien stuff. Uh, that uh, man, I got out of. We had been driving forever. And of course, the car, car is air conditioned. And I got out in that New Mexico heat. Good sweet heavens, was it not? <laughs> Dry. I mean, it was like dipping into a, a. I don't know what it was, but it was really hot, 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 hot. What you say in uh, Robin Williams' movie, um, Good Morning Vietnam, it's hotter than a snake cat. <clears throat> That's what it is. It's hotter than a snake cat. Hey, forget the heat. Can we get rid of the pandemic already? <laughs> I didn't recall, Steve, that you were saying a few months ago this is only last a month or so. <laughs> well, you know, uh, what I said was, what I said was we'd have a handle on it within a month. or with, I figured six weeks or so we would get a handle on it. 
Uh, and I can't honestly say if we've got a handle on it or not. The uh, the numbers you read are all over the place. Uh, I know that people are getting, you know, they, they're finding more and more people have COVID than, than they did before. That's for acting up through the, through the rafters, but uh, that means not as many people are dying with the death rates being ratcheted down. Uh, but they're still, I mean, they're just all over the place. And they're just getting these, these weird responses. I read some weird article yesterday from Florida that, some of these clinics have re registered 98% of those people tested had had a coronavirus. And it came out that, in fact, it wasn't 98%, it was 9.8%. But that's what was reported to the state was the 98%. So I don't know if the state calculated that into there. I have no idea. The whole thing, uh, the whole thing is complete. It's a, uh, it's a grade A clusterfuck out there. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I suspicion strongly that uh, a lot of the young folks have decided that they're done with this, and that's why they're pouring out onto the beaches and <laughs> hanging out in groups and whatnot, because uh, they know that the death rate on their age bracket is is absolutely minuscule. I did read, uh, Jason, you'll be glad to know, I, I meant to say this and send it to my wife, that... Um, when they compare the death rate from COVID to the influenza epidemic of 1918, the influenza epidemic actually impacted all age brackets. Little people, middle aged, everybody, uh, pretty high, but COVID 19 is not, it's, you know, the coronavirus is not, it's really just impacting the, the upper age bracket. <clears throat> crazy times we live in, absolutely crazy times. We have had, I think, in the Union a deficit of leadership. Uh, from the top all the way down to the bottom. I think Arkansas has done a pretty good job, but uh, it's just been it's just been a horrible deficit of leadership. But we run into that frequently in a republic. That's the nature of our animal, isn't it? We elect people, and uh, that's their job to get up there and rule, and they don't have any more chance to do this. <laughs> the, whole, the whole purpose is to get them up there. So someone will be doing something, so we can get back to work and do it as we're, we're doing, uh, and, and let the government leave us be. They us in peace to do our thing. Uh, but, pandemics aside, uh, we are here to talk about GM Church of Trade number 56. Uh, what, was, what was today? Oh, yeah, catching them off guard. That's what was going on today. Uh, one of the, uh, just a good thing for a, a GM to be in the habit of doing, catching, catching players off guard. Because, uh, uh, it, it, uh, you don't want anything to become too rough. You don't want anything to become too you know, static. Uh, I, I got into a bad habit a few years back and every game was just about they fall almost the same the same routine. I remember um I enjoyed the show community, but I remember that who did that? Who did community? Dan Harmon's community. I, I remember reading an article that he wrote a few months back. Um that stories all follow a very predictable pattern. Uh, I can't remember what it is, but it's introduction of the problem. I struggle with the problem, solve the problem, or something like that. I can't remember what it was. It was a pretty kind of uh, border play thing, and he had this circle of, of whatever, whatever he was calling. And I don't agree with what Dan said. I think that, I think that was the, the way he chose to write. And if you look at Community, a good show, but if you look at Community, it's kind of that way. How's it going, Blue Box RPG? Uh, if you look at Community, it kind of goes that way. But I think that uh, as... As game masters, we can easily, easily slide into that concept that, that the story is wrote, and it's all the same kind of thing over and over and over again. You know, uh, characters meet, have to go to the dungeon, plunge the dungeon, play the monsters, get the treasure, go to the dungeon, play the monsters, and blah, blah, blah. But it certainly, it certainly does not have to be that way at all. Uh, you can definitely shake things up. You don't have to end stories. Frequently, if you look at life, our lives, your lives, everybody's lives, Sometimes things don't get resolved. Right? They just sit there unresolved for weeks or months or years or forever. Uh, and they just don't get resolved. It's just the way it is. There's mysteries that are not solved. We still don't know certain things that happen to people or where they went or what they did. Or, uh, all kinds of all, just all kinds of stuff that we don't know. And that, that's the real story. That's the story that Dan Harmon's not understanding. He's always looking for a resolution or he's looking for... Uh, that way to capture the audience, keep the audience, and then bring them back next week. But your story doesn't have to be that way. Your story, especially when you're you can change all that. You can change the paradigm up. You can do all kinds of stuff. 
let's see. And, and, so yeah, we're here for <laughs> tricks. I, I think I went off topic there a little bit. Uh, we're here for tricks and trading with the six, catching them off guard. Uh, and if you have not already, please give us a follow. Uh, we sure appreciate any kind of support that you can throw our way and uh, let people know about the stream. Uh, get on whatever social media you use, if you use any, uh, and let folks know what's going on. And today we are going to do. Hold on, I'm doing all this. <laughs> there you go. Uh, today we are going to uh, have some kind of giveaway. Uh, sometime later in the show, I don't know when, but we're gonna we're gonna do a, a giveaway. Tim was just telling me that uh, Arkansas today just passed a mandatory mask for the pandemic, and that's another thing that you know you can find all kinds of literature for and all kinds of literature against. There's no real what was it, some study came out of Japan ten years ago, eight years ago, or something where they tried to decide whether the mask had an impact on just spreading the common cold, or if it, if the health board was only in all the tests that they did, and they found absolutely no evidence the mask had any impact on slowing the spread or whatever of the common cold. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I think that there is so much, there's, there's so much information out there, and we haven't had time to process it. And, and our government, which uh, governs poorly at the best of times, uh, is. It's just, it's just kind of caught off guard, you know, it's just, so it's just kind of reacting uh, to Twitter, mostly. But <laughs> it's reacting to whatever, I don't know, but uh, it's what our government does. Uh, it's the EU plot holes. Nothing catches your praise off guard. Like something that seems a plot hole, they can't resolve. Totally serious about that. Life is an actually full of stupid decisions and plot holes. That's right, Jason's spot on. I mean, and that's the thing. We make, we make decisions all the time on stuff that we're doing, and we don't know if it's going to work or not. And frequently it doesn't, and frequently we don't even know how it was resolved. It just, you know, you didn't wear your mask, you get coronavirus. You wore the mask, and you, maybe you didn't. Maybe you avoided 14 infections already. You just don't have any idea. So there's all kinds of stuff that you can do to keep things, you know, you can bring life at, to the table, just how you live it. You can certainly, you know, the, the experiences that you have, and you never know what's around the corner. You absolutely never know what's around the corner. You think you can, you can plan for it, you can hope for it, you can whatever, but uh, uh, shit can change on a dime very, 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 uh, too frequently, really. <laughs> it's just the way it is. You know, Decimus Observer, I have told people for years, it's funny you should say that, I've told people for years, and one of the reasons I read so much history, one, I'm just fascinated with it, but I'm also, uh, I, I read history because there's things that happen in history that actually happen that are so outrageously bizarre that it makes no sense to your brain and you can't quite cognate, you know, <laughs> all that's going on. And it's weirder than fiction. It's weirder than, than your story unfolding the way you expect your story to unfold or, uh, you know, the plot, whatever, to, to mature like it's going to. And I think one of the strange things I read, um, this is, this is going to be in the Zulu Wars, the colonial wars when they, England was conquering the Zulus, and uh, there's this moment where this, I can't remember what the English officers had someone travel to the family on. I can't remember what they had, a bat, a batman? Is it a batman? I think it's a batman. I think that's what they call a batman. Um, and so they're traveling, they're, they're in this running battle with some Zulus. There's only a few English members, they're in this running battle, uh, and the officer goes down, and the batman reins his horse and turns around and leaps off to, to check on his officer, and he finds his officer in the middle of this battle, all this, you know, fury going on around him, that the officer was actually picking up a butterfly off of the ground. He was an avid butterfly collector, and he wanted to, he saw a butterfly that was very rare in the middle of this battle, so he stopped it as a butterfly. And you're reading it, and you're going, what the ever-loving, <laughs> that doesn't even make sense. <laughs> but these things happen, and who was that? They made the movie out of the mountain man who crawled on his, uh, crawled, like, for six weeks, is that right? Am I remembering that right? Uh, they made the movie off of them. It's just absolutely like the history film was, was just stuff that defies comprehension. So just go read it. Go, go find some history books uh, and, and read them. You'll, you'll be surprised at what you find. Jeremiah Johnson. It, no, they made the movie off. It's not Jeremiah Johnson. It's the one that DiCaprio's movie. Um, and he's actually not well known, interestingly enough, uh, other than the movie. He's not one of the big guys that we all all think about. But um, what the hell is he captured in the movie? Great movie. Something about he gets eaten by the bear. The bear chews him up or some kind of crap. Uh, let's see. 
The Revenant, yes, that's it. Yes, so the Revenant, the Revenant is based on a, the story of a mountain man, uh, and he was wounded by a bear, and he ended up pulling himself out of a grave site and dragging himself for weeks through the wilderness uh, until he got, you know, somewhere. Where they were, some post somewhere in the mountains. And when you just think about crawling with a broken, two broken legs through the wilderness, to have to do this. Well, I think, was it Jim Bridger that sewed his scalp back on? One of them got bit. Uh, yeah, that movie is a fantastic. It's a little slow. The movie's a little bit slow, but the movie is fantastic. I strongly recommend anyone watch it who does, who runs games in the outdoors. That movie is just fantastic. Captures all kinds of stuff the wet and the cold and. And all kinds of stuff. But I think it was Jim Bridger who got bit in the head by a bear, and he sewed his scalp. And Jim Bridger might have been Jeremiah Johnson. I don't know, but he sewed his scalp back on. And you're just thinking about this stuff. Like, what the? We stub our toe, and we're like, ah, my toe. Uh, crazy, crazy day. All kinds of stuff. But uh, yeah, definitely go watch the Revenant. A little bit off topic from Jim Strickland. So, so let's get to the Jim Strickland trade. I forgot all about other things. Uh, at least we haven't started talking about heavy metal, which is a good, <laughs> a good thing. But uh, so the first trigger trade, the first thing I like to do uh, is make an NPC very friendly to the party. Is to have an NPC that they encounter who actually jokes with them, takes their arrogance in stride, laughs with them, you know, pokes fun a little bit back at them, uh, and and just kind of you know ingratiate, not ingratiate, that's not the right word, but just is very friendly and helpful to the people, to the players. I'll often do that. Um, I just and they actually help where they can they heal them sometimes or whatever it is. They lend assistance when it's not asked for and they give them money to pay their time. Whatever it is, a really super friendly NPC can be very off putting for characters, for players, particularly because they're so used to everything that comes across the screen as a plot point that they have to, you know, dissemble and, and understand and utilize towards the, the goal. And most players, I would say the vast majority of players, and the information that's coming at them, that's what they're using it for. So it's all problem solving. It goes beyond the, the idea of role playing and into just this is the night's adventure is X. This is going to last four or five games. We need to resolve this. Every piece of information that comes at us needs to be dissected. And uh, uh, so a friendly NPC that has really nothing to do with the plot, it's really just a friendly NPC. Uh, it's just a cool concept to throw, it throws a wrench into people's thinking. Um, it also actually helps role playing a lot long term because then you can actually have helpful NPCs that aren't just, you know, constantly antagonizing the players or that the players are constantly antagonizing and creating all of this drama that you don't really necessarily want to do. So having friendly NPCs not only uh, can catch the players off guard in a huge way, but it can actually see the game in all kinds of kinds of cool stuff that, that kind of evolved later. Uh, I'd even take it the other direction. I include at least 50% friendly and helpful NPCs in my game. That makes it even harder when uh, one another. That's right. See, I, what I generally do, I don't know if I go that high on friendly, probably probably 2 and 10 are friendly, but the vast majority are just, they're not friendly or unfriendly. They're just the people you meet at the grocery store that help check you out or pack your bags or uh, if you happen to live in New Jersey, fill your gas tank up with gas. I think it's illegal to do that there in New Jersey, but uh, just people like that. And then very, I try. Now, I, I used to do the opposite when I was younger. And see, my games were different. Uh, NPCs were invariably you know, rough. But uh, uh, very few of them are actually actively trying to hurt or annihilate or take from or in any way inhibit the party. Uh, because what they are alluding to, as you start getting, they get gun shy of everybody. Three or four NPCs kind of screw them over for, you know, or two or three games, and, and they're done. Everybody's an enemy, and that just makes running the game harder. It doesn't help us. <laughs> it really kind of it gums up the works somewhat. Uh, you know, we've talked about it an awful lot on this channel that uh, NPCs are super, 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 super important and to the game and need, need to be utilized in a, a myriad of number of ways. Uh, the DM sent, as he tells us, hey, everyone just, oh, yeah, so. What are we doing? Oh, he's just thanking everybody. Okay. <laughs> Most people in the frontier are suspicious of new folks in town until they prove themselves that they wish no harm. They just don't trust. Yeah, and, it, and you can do it. You can play it up, but you don't. I mean, if you've, if you've lived in the country or you are experienced with country people, and they are distrustful. They are slow to, um, I don't know if they're judgmental so much. They're just slow to react. They're slow to help. They're slow to do anything. 
until you've kind of broken that that bar and you're you're in it. I mean, once you've proven that you're friendly or not rude or not judgmental or not these things, country people can be extremely friendly, extremely nice. Uh, it's just a different, it's slightly different mode of living, uh, a little bit slower, and people out in the frontier, outside of town, they generally have to rely on themselves or their neighbors or people, you know, traveling or what have you that may be able to sell them something, uh, you know, or fix something. They may have a skill that they don't. So you certainly can play it, you know, untrusting, but it doesn't have to be antagonistic. It could be something that quickly develops into even more. But it's definitely a trust thing because the same thing applies when you're on the frontier. You're the law, right? When you're alone with your family in a cabin 70 miles from any town, uh, anyone comes up to that house can be can be dangerous. So it's the other side of the coin. I think. Small towns, small towns can be nosy, but that has pros and cons with people living there. Anyone got in trouble is going to be seen, and they're going to know, right? They're going to know. They're going to know and tell each other <laughs> what these people, these strangers, who have come to town have done this. Uh, these type of things. Who are the people in your neighborhood? In your neighborhood, the people that you need to share. Yeah, these are the ones. They, and they don't they don't have to be super friendly, but they can definitely be friendly uh, just to help pick up the pace, just to to break that stigma of everything and every person and every monster that the characters meet um, has to be dealt with with the blade or that. And I'm not advocating to <laughs> this kind of Peace and love RPG, minor, extraordinarily violent. <laughs> so, don't, don't expect otherwise, but uh, um, it certainly doesn't have to always be that way. Everybody's not out to get you. I like using NPCs such as a stable hand, etc. It it's helpfully respect on a willing to run errands and stuff. Very useful. Yeah, they're very cool, and it, it, that certainly helps. It's, what I'm, it's kind of what we're alluding to. It certainly helps with the hand. It's the hardest thing. <laughs> Here we go. Sesame Street. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Rogers. Ah, you know I don't like Mr. Rogers. <laughs> I used to watch Mr. Rogers when I was a youngster. Uh, it, it's just unrealistic <laughs> appraisal. It's an unrealistic appraisal of the way things are in the world. <laughs> so, that would be fan of Mr. Rogers. I can't believe I just got seen. No. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, so there. So we'll leave Mr. Rogers out of the conversation. Oh, Mr. Rogers. Didn't they just do a movie on him? Didn't Tom Hanks do, uh, do a movie on him? He has been elevated to such a status, that's right. Do you recognize that picture in the main title? Mm <clears> hmm. <throat> The lich coming out of something. I do not. Where is that? <laughs> Where is that from, Babuski? I did not see. I, I have not seen the Mr. Rogers film, so I may have to say I love Tom Hanks now. I was actually just looking at the, the trailer for Joe versus the Volcano last night. I hadn't seen that forever in a day. I may have to. Uh, I may have to <laughs> put that in this weekend and watch Joe versus the Volcano. Uh, how's it going, Mr. Doug? Thanks for joining us. The Lost City, if I recall correctly. Gaxmore. That's some gags. What crazy? That's crazy. How's it going, 42? <laughs> <Brain plan. laughs> That's uh, Joe versus the Volcano. Yeah, I'm going to put it in Absolutely love that movie. It's been a long time. I love Meg Ryan. She's just awesome. And she's really, really awesome in that movie. He opened it, Fred Rogers, in that IRL. Rogers didn't use his TV voice, and he was not dead. He talked like a normal human being. Uh, no bullshit, the Lost City, B4. Oh, B4, not the Lost City of Gatsmore. Oh. So now, B4, just to let everybody know, is the adventure that broke me on adventures. Uh, so I purchased it a gazillion years ago when it came out, and uh, when I started playing the guys through it, it had, like, I think it's B4, I'm pretty sure this is the one. Like, in one room, it had, uh, like, a Manticore, and in the room next door, there was you know, an ogre, and then in the room next door, there was a hill giant, and then in the room next door, there was a, you know, a, 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 a whatever, a gorilla, I have no idea, but I, I could not envision in my head how all these monsters were in these rooms next to one another, who was feeding them, <laughs> so it just kind of, it broke me, <laughs> it broke me, it's when I kind of began doing my own thing, I think, 
I knew Fred Rogers somewhat. He used to frequent a movie theater and work at when I was a teen. Oh, that's very cool, Jason. That's very, very cool. <laughs> Mr. Rock. Uh, big four. That lost city. Good. All right. So the lost city is Gatsmore, don't you know? I've been working on Gatsmore all week and all last week. So. <laughs> that lost city is, is way you didn't in my brain pants. Uh, which is a good thing. So let's move on to trigger the trade number two. Uh, yes. What are we doing? What is this one? So I picked country songs, uh, country music songs. For all these things. I believe this is Timmy Lou Harris. One of my dad's favorite things. Uh, oh, yeah, Big Rock, Candy Mountain. Can't roll a skate in a buffalo herd. I <laughs> love that song. You need to go listen to that song. It's an absolutely fantastic song. Uh, so what are we doing? Born to Run. Oh, yeah, so this is a fun one. So now, I kind of picked up this this from Davis years ago. Because when he runs, we talked about this before. Davis will give all of his monsters personalities and all kinds of you know, back stories and stuff. So he hates uh, so I kind of adapted this philosophy. They frequently quit in battle, but I kind of adapted this philosophy of occasionally the monsters just quit. They quit the field. They're smart enough to see that they're going to get defeated or they're going to lose more than they gain. Uh, they don't. They're not, you know, driven by pride or arrogance or the need to compete or whatever it is that drives, you know, Homo sapiens. Um, they have a different drive, or they just don't want to die, uh, and that could be a huge part of it. Um, and they run, they just flee. I did it very, very recently in the Thursday night game. They ran into this extraordinarily powerful witch, um, and uh, the mage immediately attacked her, instantaneously attacked her, and I had her flee the run. Uh, she wasn't ready. Uh, I don't know if she could have defeated the party. I have no idea, but it's pretty powerful. But uh, she fled, and it, it just confounded everybody. And she ended up talking to them and trying to befriend them later. Um, and uh, the, the whole thing kind of, the whole the whole encounter, the whole evening game turned on the dime. It's very, very cool. So having a monster pick up and get out of there uh, before it gets killed can be very kind of unsettling to players. They don't know why the monster left. They don't know where the monster's going. They don't know if they can pursue the monster. They don't even know if they defeated it or if something else is going on. It's kind of drawing into a trap. Uh, any number of things. It's just a, a nice way uh, to stop the characters in their tracks uh, and make them kind of regroup, you know, think this, is, uh, this oddity is happening. Now, it's a little tricky sometimes because you do want to try to make it. You don't want to rig it, but you, you want to try to make it so the monster can actually get away and it's not, you know, just run and get slain with its back to the party and some rogue backstab it with quadruple damage. But um, if you can somehow get the monster to you know, to, to, to break contact and get out, uh, that would be, uh, that, that's just a cool thing to do, a cool thing for monsters to do. Uh, to be honest, I often have enemies not run because they're intelligent enough to realize that the, the PCs are faster than they, and they can't, and the escape isn't like, well, that is definitely the other side to it. When you're playing your monster smart, when, and if the monster is intelligent, it's going to be smart, right? It's going to, to be able to, uh, you know, to size up a threat and to determine whether it can at least have a chance or it doesn't have a chance. And as you know, doesn't it's going to be able to know if fleeing the battlefield is going to be more detrimental uh, than actually staying on the battlefield. What is that called? Uh, what, to break contact with an enemy, I can't remember there's some terminology floating around my head. That's really an extraordinarily dangerous uh, move for any kind of military unit to make, is to break contact and withdraw. Uh, and to avoid both a route and a casualty. So, yeah, if you're playing your monster smart, uh, that's definitely the way to go. They want to preserve their life. No meal is worth dying, and no goal and no dying for it, and no goal is worth dying if you have a chance to come back and compete and complete your goals later. That actually plays into a nice point the, um, that I think I alluded to in that, the tricks. If they run away, it may just be that they, they just want the hell out. They don't want to die. They're just get, getting out of there and running off. Uh, screw these guys. But it may be that they want to regroup and come back and revisit this, this party with more strength or more allies or what have you. And it's a, it's a great one. I did this with an orc a gazillion years ago. We ended up we named him Orange Hair because the miniature had Orange Hair. But um, Orange Hair hounded the party for years until they were really too high level for the orc to have any impact. But it was several years of game that Orange Hair kept coming back. And he's got a running joke in the game now because... Uh, it's just that NPC that ran away and survived. But it is a definitely a good way to get people, uh, you know, questioning what's going on. Someone asked the other day on the Facebook group how we handle morale, what to roll, and when. My answer was, I say this is, with no snark or ill intent, 
intense. Just one, just use common sense. You know me taking a video and you're going to cut their losses and run. Yeah, I'm not. I, I, I agree with that completely, Jason. I don't know if the CKG has morale rules. I want to say that it does. I want to say that Casey Christopherson wrote some for Field of Battle, and we carried that. We did, you know, Field of Battle is a full on book that we did. But we did a, an abbreviated version, an abridged version, and put it in the CJG. I think there's more algorithms in, in there. But I kind of do like you do. If it, you got 20 orcs attacked and six or seven of them are dead and three or four of them are wounded, there's a good chance they're fixed to get annihilated. And it might be time to break contact and run. If, if an enemy can reasonably escape and has, has reason to, they should. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it really, players aren't going to be expecting that, right? They really aren't going to expect it because the idea behind it is you need the market. Uh, but when the monsters actually play a lot of their characters, you know, they don't want to die, then it's really good to... When Stephen King and Black Tooth Ridge recently, I had a situation where the characters uh, had slaughtered a reasonable section, a reasonable section of Fargold, and then barricaded themselves in a room to rest up. The remaining inhabitants have taken took the opportunity to sneak out. Oh, nice! <laughs> Everybody's just gone. That's pretty cool! I mean, that's the way to do it, right? They they heal up, they do the role playing, they get their weapons ready and all that shit, and they come banging out of the door like crazy, and everybody's gone. That's, that's fantastic. And it, and it's now they're going to be questioning. They're going to be wondering where everybody went. It's a trap that way. I have some bushes somewhere. I can do work. Most highly intelligent monsters bosses will have an escape plan in their heart. Yeah, absolutely. They should. And too frequently, I don't have escape plans for mine, but <laughs> i got to wing it, but, but they should, definitely. Running jokes are a big benefit of longer campaigns, <laughs> no doubt. And we, we ran a game from uh, 85, God, it's mad, right now, from 85 to, uh, I don't know, we still play it once in a while, but we probably quit playing it in regular in 02 or 03. That's a big game. A lot of that, you know, spilled into the Code of Um And now we've been running the game from 2006 to today. Last time we played it two weeks ago. And just tons of running jokes. It's one of the good things about campaigns. I strongly, that's my type of style. I strongly recommend everybody run campaigns. One shots are cool, but campaigns are just awesome. I've recently put morale rules on the Facebook forum. It's got heaps of great suggestions. Let me check, you know, uh, check out the Discord channel too. The TLG Discord channel's got uh, mountains of just great information on there. I'm going to pop into the CKG right quick. Just somewhere in the back of my head, I thought we had some morale rules somewhere. Morale. So we got Army, uh, 212, and a CKG. CKG is actually just chock full of all kinds of mess. Uh, yeah, so if you go to page 212 in the Catholic Hebrew Guide, there's, some, there's Casey Christopherson's morale rules that he wrote for about. Uh, check those out. They're pretty good. Casey's a really good game guy. Yeah, there you go. Jim was just <laughs> Jim was just saying that's great. <laughs> and see, Jason, again, another side of that, never has they throw your players for a loop by having someone run full tilt into their camp in the middle of the night. I went through that adventure by having the players camp down in the night when suddenly a man a man in priestly robes dash into the camp. Riddled with arrows being chased by men on horseback, also in clerical robes, the same one. The wounded guy pressed something into their hero's hands and said, don't let them get this. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. You, it can definitely go the other direction. Uh, anything anything that makes players kind of take the double take and know that they're not in a story that's the same old story over and over again. Uh, it's a great idea, Jason. Recurring vengeful monsters are far more interesting. I love those. Absolutely love them. Uh, I love, and I like those that linger behind the scenes that, you know, that really aren't part of the game. For, they just hear about it for long, long adventures. Uh, it's another advantage of campaigns to have lingering and vengeful and you know, a recurring villains. It's just cool. Uh, it gives a, a taste of, um, it, it creates a continuity and a, re, a, a realism about the game that just one shot don't have. I mean, when you're just doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, and it gives the one who got away the chance to inform others that there is a, as a threat, a chance for an that they leave the dungeon with their publisher. <laughs> with their point their publisher. <laughs> with their plunder. Yeah, that's it. I mean, and, and the characters aren't going to know. They're just never going to know. All right, so we got, I just want to remind everybody, we do have a giveaway coming up very soon. Uh, I'm, I'm running way behind. I need to get into t to number three. What are we doing here? Big Rock, Sandy Mountain. So this kind of follows the same... Uh, yes, Barry Kingdom, there is 
Cummingham, Cummingham. There is a Discord channel, I think, uh, posted up above. Uh, there we go. Good Lord, I'm way behind. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Let's see, hey, blah, blah, blah. Can you gain levels on the Discord too? I, you can. I think, yeah. See if this pledges. Okay, there you go. So, so trick of the, the trade number three. Um, Big Rock Candy Mountain, great song for our lives. Check it out. It's absolutely hilarious. It'll teach you, I mean, it'll give you an allusion to uh, the, the horrors of a short handled double uh, if you're a hobo. So, great, great song. Go listen to it. But basically, what we're talking about here is just magic items or treasure or something mm -hmm. very valuable and useful the players just find. There's no real reason for it. It's, it's there, it's been there for years, or it's been there for days. It doesn't matter. They just stumble upon it. Uh, and especially if it's magic, especially if it's got some kind of potency to it, then you're going to have all kinds of it. And it's just going to confuse the characters. They're going to confuse the players because they're not going to know exactly what, <laughs> why. Is this a trap? Is this part of some greater thematic thing or is it just whatever? Uh, it's just something that can quickly lighten something up. And uh, you know, it's great. A raffle. There you go. I don't know if we're, are we raffling? I don't know what we're doing. Uh, we're doing something. Um, we're doing something. Tim and Chuck are, are we're doing a giveaway. So I assume that's going to be a raffle. I assume that's what we do normally. I mean, what we do normally, so I assume it's going to happen next. But some kind of treasure item. Something that just fine. Uh, and uh, it can be anything. And it doesn't have to be a reason that it's there. It's just there. Uh, and obviously the greatest, uh, not yet see, obviously the greatest treasure that's just found that leads to monstrous stories is the ring, the one ring, Sauron's ring, of course. Um, I can't remember now, Aragorn's great grandpappy, whatever his name is, uh, he drops it, he just drops it. He drops it like a noob. <laughs> he just drops it in the river. Ah, I lost the ring, it's in the river. I know he was dead, but still. So the ring is, is at the bottom of the river, and uh, this knucklehead finds it, and thus begins this epic closure, really, to a massive story. And and you can take that same concept and have them find uh, find some kind of item. It doesn't have to have the value of the one ring. It can just be an item, a plus one sword that's laying there in the grass. You know, the grass growing around it, woven around the hills and whatnot. And then they find it. It's just something that's going to baffle and confuse and throw a little bit of consternation in the party uh, to, to stumble on that. Uh, not yet. Not yet, Moondog. <laughs> I think, uh, I, think I, I spoke out of turn as I often do. Okay, so here's one of my favorite things to do. I don't do it often because I don't do dungeons often and I don't do I, I don't do kind of setting the environments very often. But I did do it very recently. And that's very interesting to that there. Okay, first off, if you haven't heard the song, you can't roll a skate in a buffalo Go so, go listen to it. Like <laughs> Candy Mountain is a great song. Absolutely fantastic song. Uh, really fun. But um it's to take, you know it's billionaires are just like all of us. We're all a little eccentric. We all have things that we like and things that we want to do and ways that we envision things and, uh, you know, whatever it is. I want to live in a castle. If I was a billionaire, I would literally build a castle. I would build it, and it would be grassy. It would be hay on the ground. <laughs> you know, because that's what they did. Uh, I, I would love it. That would be cool. And why wouldn't there be eccentric, you know, goldenaires, whatever, whoever has a billion gold pieces in these fantasy worlds, and it would do strange and odd things. Uh, so creating an eccentric, creating a room that an eccentric design is a great way, is a fantastic way to really, um, yeah, <laughs> very current. <laughs> yeah, he's a real throwback, even even before my youth. The last one, Crystal Gale, was from you know, when I was young. I song, I love that song. I must believe it. But uh, just to have the room, things in the room that are just ah. Oh, is it an eccentric what hat, whether it's the design of the room, the color of the room, or the things that are in the room, they're just odd and strangely placed. And they don't have anything to do with the game, they don't have anything to do with the plot or the adventure or anything other than this is something that this wizard or fighter or whoever likes. Uh, they saw it, it caught their fancy, and they, they built it. Um, maybe it's a chamber, you know, all was only a secret door to go into where the wizard went to get away from his nagging apprentices. And this is the only place that they could find to sit in the quiet when they created this secret chamber. There's nothing in there. There's nothing valuable in there. It's just a secret chamber. There's a little oven in there to keep the fellow warm. Uh, so anything like that that, that helps kind of uh, 
it just makes people go, wait, what? Uh, and then they're going to start investigating it. They're going to start trying to figure out the, to unravel the lie of this room when there's nothing to unravel. It's great fun. Uh, it really, it certainly distracts players for a while. All of these things, it's, it's something that you can do if you need to buy a little time. Throw that out there. The DM, uh, GM, throw it out there, and you can buy a little time. <laughs> It fix whatever behind the screen you think is good. And see, Steve, extra points if you can tell me where the pick on the right came from, the fellow in roller skate. Wait a minute. What, what's happening? I didn't update. Oh, wait. Wait a minute. I'm all over this place. Okay. Boy, he is on roller skates, isn't he? <laughs> I did not notice that. That is so funny. Uh... I have no idea. That's got to be a rodeo, but he's in the mud. That looks like a buffalo for certain. I, that's probably not real. <laughs> yeah. Now that you say that, certainly that is Johnny Knoxville. <laughs> that is great. <laughs> it's the also having a pat on the floor has a peaky's office. I'm trying to look out and try to relate to crap. Get him jumping at shadows. Yeah, I did that very thing. I had a pat or a floor that they went into had a green and black checkered pattern, and they they spent a little time trying to figure out what it was. Yeah, that's it. That's just the thing. You can pile on the wall, all kinds of stuff. Anything that you can think of to make them think, you know, what the, what the devil? Uh, it's just a good way to do it. I see, they, they're so, you see, yes, there's a few things so amusing as that 45 minute period where players are going, oh, my book, it was like a stick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Johnny Knoxville, that's hilarious. I enjoy watching Johnny Knoxville. I got it. It's quite, it's, it's very, very interesting. Uh, all right, so I think we are through trigger the trade number four. Uh, I'm being shouted at over here by some, uh, Davis. I don't know what Davis is shouting at me about. NPC Almanac stuff. What is the wait? I'm not sure what he's got. Something over there. Okay, everyone, I'm about to start raffle. Once it's announced, please type exclamation mark raffle uh, in the thing of my job here. Did you announce it? I, well, you, they they went. Um, I assume that's what you wanted to do, Chuck. <laughs> they're all everybody knows. <laughs> yeah. So wait until when Chuck says go, or when I say go, here's your raffle. Uh, everyone put raffle <laughs> raffle in there. Uh, it, it's coming very soon. So Chuck, what are you waiting for? Get her set up. Garbage truck downhill on fire. Good lord. Well, that's, that's not good, Rockstar. <laughs> that's not good at all. <coughs> I see. There we go. All right, camera's saying stuff. Nope, nobody's saying anything. All right. All right, Chuck, what are we doing? So we're doing a giveaway here. Um, type raffle. To, okay, now type raffle. Everybody type raffle. Uh, exclamation mark raffle. And that will enter you to enter, enter you to win whatever is being offered. Do we know what's tough? Do we know what's being offered? Tim, what's being offered? Um, let me ask Tim right quick. And then we'll dive into trigger trade number five. Uh, we must believe in magic. Yeah, so this is something that actually... Raffle Tim down the chance. This is something that actually uh, Gary brought up, Gary Gygax brought up in his... Um, his book, Living Fantasy. If you haven't had a chance to get that book, I, I know those things are going for crazy prices these days. But um, uh, Living Fantasy has, it, it really, that, what Gary did is he sat down and he created, he wrote what a world would be like that actually had magic. Uh, you know, much like our own that actually has technology, things change. There'd be a different way of looking at things, a different way of uh, just perceiving the world around you. And there would be magic, you know, not in everything that we're doing, but it would be a part of our life. And so that's one of the things you can do is you can take this concept and run with it in your day. Have lingering effects of magic spells, magic monsters, just magic in general, where things are just different, where you come to a rock and you can see into another world, uh, where there's just a different take on it. So it's a $50 coupon in the store is what we are giving away today. Uh, so definitely in an exclamation mark raffle. Uh, to, to possibly earn your $50 coupon. <laughs> I was just trying to rely on God. <laughs> there you go. Uh, another... All right, so anyway, yeah, so just use some kind of magic. It's a great song, too. It's very low-key, very, very uh, 
called a very sweet song by a Crystal Gale if you're inclined to a little old 70s country music. Maybe 80s. Uh, but yeah, weave magic. Don't forget to weave magic into the game and have the players actually stumble across it or, uh, you know, find it uh, or unravel it or whatever whatever it is. And not only will it take them aback and kind of get them where they're looking at this thing and say, what's going on here? Is there something bigger here? The same thing in all of these. That thing you're doing, but it, it it just creates a nice energy about it uh, that you're living in a magical world, uh, and and magic has something goes beyond just a magic missile or the lightning bolt and turn on dead or whatever, whatever it is. Uh, so weave magic into your game as much as you can. It's just a, a great way to. I'm really big on letting NPCs use magic that the players have no clue what it is. If you don't have to play uh, by the same rules as PC, you know that's an interesting point. Uh, Jason, and you're right, and one of the things that GMs frequently, frequently forget, and I frequently forget this, uh, when, you've got, when you've got a monster that's intelligent or moderately intelligent and it has magic items, there's a good chance it's going to be using those magic items if it has the capacity to understand what they are. So don't forget that your magic items, your monsters, like your NPCs, can actually use these magic items. It's a little off of what we're talking about with uh, We Must Leave the Magic, but it's the same kind of principle. Uh, bringing magic to the table is a great thing. I often, uh, sadly, I too often forget about magic, and don't. And, and several games go by where there's nothing kind of mystical happening. I'm trying to, I'm trying to break that habit. Uh, uh, only some get, only some get feedback. Are, we, are you getting feedback? Uh, there, retro. Iron Jack, <laughs> Adventure of Jackpack. I love that book. That's a good book. Amazing Adventures. Invariably, someone will go, how did they do that? And I go, I don't know. How did they? <laughs> yeah, I love those questions. How did that happen? I don't know. Figure it out. <laughs> Make a check or something. <laughs> Unravel the problem yourself. I'm just along for the ride, man. I'm still waiting on the trolls. I'll message that says I'm in the raffle. Don't, didn't see it. Does it not post that message? Uh, yeah, yeah, you put a message next to your great back Texas. You might, yeah, just do the raffle. I think you did it there, yeah. Uh, there you go. Yeah, I think you confused when you said 10,000 chances. I think you confused the, the algorithm on what I was uh, There you go. Yeah, only some uh, are getting a blah, blah, blah. Mom doesn't have to realize that it's not going to use. Yep, it should use it uh, if it can. Now, obviously, you know, if it's a, a naga, it probably can't use a, a ring of whatever or a girdle of stone jacket. But if it can use it and has the capacity, it does. See, we've got some hacking going on. Even, and even a dumb monster might put on a ring or a headband that still helps it. Yep. Gives it extra AC, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, don't forget your monsters. Don't forget your monsters. They're people, too. They're not real people. They're monsters. But I don't ever think of a people just kill them. Just let them die. <laughs> it's like, and did any news on the new version of Cutter's Guitar? Yes, Mr. O'Donnell. I am told that it will be on the truck with the Codex, Tel uh, with the Codex Egyptium on the 22nd of February. Now, giving them a day or two. Uh, leeway, uh, that is, what, next Wednesday? So hopefully by no later than Thursday, that's right, 23rd, no later than Thursday on the 23rd, it's on a truck heading in our direction, um, and we will have both the Health Army just in, in, in hand, which would be fantastic to get that series back up and running and plus release this to the Kickstarter. So I am hoping that by the 27th, and now that's assuming it takes about a day to get all this stuff put in the warehouse and squared and the, the, the copies we got into the mailroom and blah, 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 blah. But in theory, um, we should be shipping by the point of it. I, I hope that we're shipping by the point of We will see. So very, very soon. Very, very, very soon. Let's see. Blah, blah, blah. Maybe some farmer had a, had a, a pretty ring that decided to use as a nose ring on a his front. Now that would be awesome. That's a great idea, Commander Peak. That is a fantastic idea. That's a magic item that nobody's going to ever think of. But there it is in the cow's ring. It's, why why does the, the farmer doesn't know? He doesn't know the magic. What does he care? That's just fantastic. That's the stuff. That's thinking out of the box that really helps your game, you know, just make people think, oh, wait, what? And they want to come back to the table because it's this, this weird shit going on. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> great. With our mediocre intelligence, yes, indeed. <laughs> I don't have a problem with magic as a whole. I just feel like it creates too many shortcuts. I take away from the creative problem solving. It really annoys me when I have something uh, set up that is 
easily overcome with a single signal. Oh, that man, far wonder, boy, you're far wonder, you got that dead on. That's one of the, I've kind of soured on the high level game I'm running now because there's so much magic at the table that almost anything that I have put forward, they have solved instantly with whatever spell or variant of spell or ability. And it's gotten frustrating. He got so frustrating that I kind of had to call the game off. And that's where I redesigned. I designed the switch and I redesigned this plane that they went into. Uh, I created this haunted cottage. This is something I talked about a few weeks ago. Um, I created some shadow magic and I made a foe that was extremely powerful and nothing acted as it should have. Everything kind of seemed strange. They kept seeing and Chuck and Tay. There was just strange things on it. Because uh, I was trying to break that. that mode it's just it's just the magic is just overwhelmed the game and it's, it's, they're having fun they think for a little bit it's going to be fun because they're problem solving so quickly but i know half my players will be bored off their skull in three games because they're just succeeding at everything so quickly and it's not it's not nearly as fun as as, as it's chalked up to be a hyper intelligent troll that has devised a scheme to unite the humanity support their own nation there you go uh that's the troll lord actually in the codex of aired and uh, that is a breed of trolls, and they live in Castle Knock up in some valley. Uh, their main opponents, their main, uh, uh, the ones that stand in front of them the most, stopping them are the stone <laughs> There's been some great ideas in this list. Absolutely. This, this one needs to be put up and out. And, and see some these magic creators, too. The players can also find their plan sorted by a basic camp that they've forgotten about. Yeah, absolutely. The hard thing about doing that, Commander Pete, is it's hard to kind of keep up with all of that stuff. Uh, you know, because you don't know what the characters are doing, and you've got these monsters and all this other crap. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's a good idea. I mean, you definitely, it's the same thing goes with those magic items. Don't forget your, your the spells that your casters can act in advance, you know. They can go out and, and do a spoiling attack against the, the party and then fall back. There's no reason to not do that. <sighs> yeah, we're about to wrap up, Rothgar. I think we're almost at five. One GM went a bit too far the other way, a countrywide anti-magic field, and didn't warn people. For that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's no. Yeah, you can't take magic out of an R or fantasy RPG, but then you're just playing a science fiction. Uh, how much time do you put into play testing new places, ideas, monsters, before putting them in print production? It kind of depends. Uh, a lot of what goes into production runs through my game on Thursday night, and. Uh, the, the sad thing is, we'll we'll run. I'll create a monster, or Mac, whoever creates a monster, and we'll run. I, I'll just put it in the game. I don't tell anyone that we're play testing this monster. That never happens. Uh, I just do it, and the way the monster kind of the way they react to it is the way um, it, it comes out. Invariably, I would say nine out of ten times, after it's in print, and I use the monster again, or I hear someone else using the monster, people are reacting to it differently. It's just something different happens. And it's not I, it's not written into the description or whatever. It's just really cool. Um, so it kind of depends. Um, usually one or two times it's kind of play tested, and then the editor, Matt, usually gets into it. Matt's a really good gauge. Uh, well, she created, co created CNC, and he's just a really good gauge of if it's one contradictory to the rules. And he actually is editing CKG now, and in the first chapter he found, hey, this isn't, he circled something, this isn't this is contradictory to what he's in, but like, what? Yeah, for five years. <laughs> uh, but he's pretty good with that type of stuff. So we usually give it a, a little bit of a play testing, one or two times, and then it, and then it rolls out. I see. Uh, I kind of go the other way. I love it when my players tear through things uh, I put together. It's all about them doing great things and being big games. Here. So when they get to do something, here, it's all about. That's okay, Jason. At times, but if it, but if you do that ten times in a row, it's just kind of my people get bored. Especially Matt. He gets in Davis. They get very, very bored with it. Uh, all right, we're doing a the giveaway. Let's see, uh, did someone win? It's some of usual one of the tips from today's game quick. A wizard can easily blink to escape. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, please, 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 please. <laughs> all right, did we get a winner? Uh, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. This. Whoa, I'm way behind. B-Man 07, you have won is what it looks like. How's that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for everyone. Yeah, especially David. He he goes off kilter when he starts getting bored and annoyed. <laughs> All right, it looks like B Man 07 won the the raffle. I think I'm reading that correctly. I am kind of an idiot. So, uh, yes, B Man 07, congratulations, good deal, uh, good deal. I hope that uh, you head over to the to the storefront. We'll probably get whatever you 
whatever you choose, out tomorrow or Monday at the absolute latest. And, and BMEN07, you need to holler at you need to holler at Babunski and let him know. Uh oh. Well, that's not good. That's not good. And y'all see people. <laughs> you see people. What's going on? I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening. All right. I'll cover for him. Okay. <laughs> there you go. So we're going to re- redraw. Is that what we have to do, Babunski? Is that what's happening? All right. Let's redraw. So anyway, as uh, Chuck is doing that, uh, thank you all for showing up with Jim Strick for trade number 56. Uh, I'll be back on Tuesday for AMA and again on Thursday and again for Tricks of the Trade 57. Uh, and then uh, I will be in uh, Founders and Legends, Luke Gygax's game on Saturday at some time <laughs> on Saturday. Um, 11? 11 Central, I believe. I'm aware of that. Uh, all right, Chuck. Let's see what we got. I'll check my timing on the... Uh, the Founders and Legends. I'm not running a game this year, but I am sitting in on loot. Um, 11 a.m. Central. I think that sounds right. I think he said 9 a.m. Pacific. Let me get over to that. Who won? Did someone win? Ultra Magnus 71. You have won. Good deal. Congratulations. How the hell are they on that date? What are these dates on about? I don't want to see it. All right, so let's go here. Congrats, uh, Ultra Magnus. Very cool. And uh, let me scroll down at the nine. At, so eleven Central Standard Time. Uh, I'll be sitting in on Luke Gygax's game, uh, doing a little game tonight. Sure, we're going to be doing A, B, and B stuff. Very cool stuff. Uh, <clears throat> But he's at least reachable in theory. What? <laughs> Is there another one out? Yeah, I gotta say good night. Uh, it's time to log off. It's five o'clock. But what are, what are we doing with this raffle? Can we get it to Ultra Magnus, or do we need to pull again? Let's see. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, he probably found out he didn't win that <laughs> So <laughs> there you have it. All right, are we, do- <laughs> are we doing? All right, there you go. What's happening? Did wait? What? I don't know what's going on anymore. Did Bifford win? Chuck, did Bifford win? <laughs> did Bifford win? <laughs> Looks like Bifford won, but he's gone off. He's gone off. Uh, killed me too. Um. <laughs> That'll learn you. All right. Hi, Jinx131. Are you still with us? Are you with us? Hi, Jinx131. You have won the rap. There he is. Someone someone is there. Congratulations. (laughs) Just give it to me. (laughs) That's great. All right. Okay, everybody. Thank you for showing up for Jim Tricks with trade number 56. Uh, Hopefully, we'll see you Saturday. And if not, we will see you next week on Tuesday and or on Thursday. Uh, We'll gather around and... uh, (laughs) <laughs> and BS a little longer. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you all. Sure appreciate it. Uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Y'all have a great weekend.